Welcome to the Engelbart Symposium. I'm Mark Weber and of the Computer History Museum, and I'm truly honored that we are able to hold this event celebrating Doug Engelbart and his team. Today, we spend far too many hours at the kind of interactive screens he and his brilliant software and hardware engineers and others demonstrated to such effect in 1968. As he foresaw, we do much of our reading, writing, and research online. We click on the hypertext links he developed using the mouse he co-invented. We chat and share documents and send messages as his team did back then. We do all of this over the kind of general purpose computer networks partly pioneered within his laboratory at SRI. But when it comes to the kind of knowledge navigation and collaboration tools that were the heart of Doug's NLS system, we've climbed only the first rung of the ladder. The same mismatch applies when it comes to the daunting goal that drove him to build all of his technology, to augment human intellect so that we might better address the world's big problems. Are those unbuilt portions of his vision useful? Is it too late to apply them to today's problems from climate change to nuclear issues or to incorporate them into an online world that is already largely constructed without them? A number of speakers today will try to address these challenges. And our panel here at the museum on Wednesday will look specifically at how to apply Engelbart's techniques to today's problems. Doug was incredibly supportive when my colleague Kevin Hughes and I were first researching the history of the web and was the keynote for the history track we did at the web conference in 1997. And we tried to introduce his work to a new generation of web developers. I would like to thank our co-sponsors and co-presenters, Vint Cerf, the Doug Engelbart Institute, and Google. Now I'm pleased to introduce our Master of Ceremonies, uh, distinguished forecaster, Paul Sappho. Don't let the title fool you. Uh, my role today is to play Vanna White to Mark Weber. Uh, I will be responsible for trying to keep this thing on time. And a friend of mine said, good luck. Silicon Valley, someday when I die, I want to die in Silicon Valley because everything there arrives late. But we are going to run this like a Shinkansen, and that will be my job. Uh, so with no further ado, let's roll the video. Douglas Carl Engelbart is a key pioneer of the kind of computing we do today. Interactive, connected, graphical, and personal. As a Navy radar operator in the Pacific, he had read Vannevar Bush's famous article, As We May Think. Its ideas would help flesh out the vision that became his life's work. To augment human intellect with techniques for collectively organizing and refining knowledge. I suddenly wondered, hey, what kind of goals should I have for career? And then for some reason, within five minutes, what popped in my head was, what if I try to maximize the value my career has to mankind? Oh, that sounds good. I have no idea where it came from. Mankind isn't getting all that much more effective at collectively dealing with complex problems. Maybe that's what I could concentrate on. So that's what I committed to. I first uh, learned of Doug Engelbart in 1961 when I was a program manager at, at NASA headquarters in their Office of Advanced Research. And a proposal from Doug came across my desk uh, proposing to work with computers in the, de in the development of information, not numbers, not arithmetic, but information. Engelbart's uh, proposal was the first concrete manifestation of this idea that I had seen, so I funded it uh, right away. In 1968, Doug's team at SRI showed off many core features of modern computing for the first time in the so-called 
mother of all demos. There was a new kind of pointing device. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way and we never did change it. There were windows, hypertext links, collapsible views, and other features for navigating information. If I want to, I can say, the library, what am I supposed to pick up there? I can just point to that and, oh, I see, overdue books and all. Well, there was a statement there with that name on it. Go back. He showed online collaboration, including document sharing, messaging, and video conferencing. I say, now, computer, do the automatic switching that'll bring in a camera picture from the camera mounted on his console, such as the camera mounted on mine is. Hi, Bill. You can see my work, you can point at it, and I can see your face, and we can talk. So let's do some collaborating. Engelbart's lab hosted the Central Network Information Center for the ARPANET and later the Internet. A forthcoming involvement is this ARPA computer network, the experimental network that's going to come into being in its first form in about a year. Engelbart's team practiced a process he called bootstrapping. And this item down here is the term bootstrapping applied in a slightly new sense. We're applying that to our approach where we're saying, we need a, a research subject group to give them these tools, put them to work with them, study them and improve them. Uh -huh. We'll do that by making ourselves be the subject group and studying ourselves. A number of NLS's technical ideas eventually got picked up by mainstream computing. The mouse, word processing, windows, and simple hypertext links. But the more sophisticated ways of navigating knowledge in NLS were forgotten, from collapsible views to integrated browsing and editing. Most of Engelbart's ideas for improving how organizations function and thus raising their collective IQ also got left behind. One of the big things we talk about about the potential is the kind of a collective intelligence. So if you look at something that you could call a social organism, an organization, and realize that if you drew an envelope around it and watched how it interacts with the outside world, you'd pretty soon be able to get some sense about what kind of IQ it has in it. Like how well does it understand what's going on? How quickly and subtly does it make a decision? How well does it marshal resources and how smart a plan does it make? Da, 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 da. And so how well does it learn what's going on and how well does it generate new knowledge and creative IQ? A key concept was how computer tools and human organizations could co-evolve. He spent the rest of his career trying to promote his larger vision. With his daughter, he co-founded the Bootstrap Institute and mouse maker Logitech donated facilities. He hoped to start a snowball effect of innovation, improved techniques enabling further improvements, and so on. I began to think about the improvement process, etc., and then I realized, oh, um, probably every organization that's going to change has an explicit category of activities. That one of them is doing your everyday work, and the other one is improving your capability to do that work and that everybody's sort of sitting at a certain capability level and there's a capability frontier out there because the technology is booming ahead and all kinds of options for how you change your learning in your human system. So, hey, it's a whole unexplored frontier. What can we learn from Engelbart's unfinished revolution today? So now we're going to dive right into things. Uh, Gardner Campbell is, please come on up. Gardner is going to give us a, an overview, lightning fast overview of the demo, and that'll be followed by a panel. Gardner, welcome to the stage. Thank you. And by the way, you notice I'm not giving Gardner a long introduction. And this is because many of you know Gardner and all the other panelists will be on stage today already. And if you don't, there's a little startup here in Silicon Valley. It starts with a G. Um, and there's this thing called the web, and you can look it up. So we're not taking time for introductions. We're giving it to Gardner's content, which is what's so important. All right. Thanks Stay very forward. much, Paul. 
Thank you. It's a great honor and a privilege to be here today. And I'm going to give you an overview of what came before the demo. In fact, I think of it as the real demo. It was what Doug himself called the public debut of a dream. And you would think, oh, well, that's got to be the demo. That was public. But no, it was a 1962 research report. As is often the case with what Doug leaves us, we think we understand. Public debut of a dream, dream, demo, n no. It's this 1962 report, and he wrote those words, the public debut of a dream, in a letter to one of his intellectual heroes, Vannevar Bush. What he meant was the dream was a conceptual framework, completed as a project report for the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. When he wrote to Vannevar Bush, it was a work in progress he was racing to finish by the time his friend J.C.R. Licklider was to arrive in Washington, D.C., a report that Doug insisted was a search report, not a research report, because very few people could yet understand what Doug was looking for. So what is a conceptual framework? This is what happens when you invite an English professor to speak to you. <laughs> we can start by saying what it is not. A conceptual framework is not a logo, slogan, motto, or brand. A conceptual framework is not operational policies. It's not even a set of clearly expressed directions. In fact, conceptual frameworks come before directions. It's a compass, not a map. And Doug makes this clear throughout the 1962 report. Conceptual frameworks are ideas to think about. Even more to the point, they're ideas to think with. A conceptual framework like the Magna Carta or like the Constitution. I believe we can all agree that however stimulating it may be as a tally-ho, move fast and break things is not a conceptual framework. <laughs> a conceptual framework aims to keep our thinking straight, open, and adequate to the occasion. In that respect, a conceptual framework closely resembles a work of philosophy. The heart of the framework is what Doug called HLAM slash T, by which he meant humans using language, artifacts, and methodologies in which they are trained. This elegant expression captured the systems approach Doug advanced, the complexly interrelated factors and in what he envisioned not merely as human-computer symbiosis, but as a human-computer co-evolutionary ecosystem. This distillation catalyzed everything that would follow, including the demo. Yet it also describes, as Doug himself knew from his rigorous habits of self-observation, his own process in writing the 1962 report. His training was many thousands of hours of research and writing. Here's just a sample of the bibliography that Doug compiled for the early stages of his work on this conceptual framework. His methods, as, they in, as he insisted they must be in a truly systems approach, were mixed methods, engineering, creative writing, a kind of game design, anthropology, linguistics, architecture, and the many modalities of what we now call information science, a field Doug helped to invent. They're all in this report. His artifacts in 1962 were mostly books, articles, a dictaphone, telephone, typewriter, pencil, pen, paper, staples, many of which have been largely superseded by the artifacts he and his lab went on to invent. Doug's language is English, but with idioms drawn from many different registers, some of them quite unusual for an engineer, as he himself acknowledges in that famous report. Two in particular seem to catch people's imagination. The first was figure two, the illustration in which Doug demonstrates augmentation by depicting its opposite, a pencil de-augmented by tying it to a brick. Doug had a way with earnest satire, and I think of this pencil with the brick page as the precursor to the question he would ask in later years. Did you ride your tricycle to work today? Doug's other memorably puckish moment in the 1962 report was the fictional character he named Joe. Now, Joe is a kind of Engelbart in disguise. 
He's explaining this augmented world, and Doug pokes fun at himself by characterizing Joe as just a little preachy. But Joe is a Virgil who guides us into the world that existed so far only in Engelbart's imagination. That Joe section in the 1962 report might well be considered an early version of the demo. And Joe is, of course, a human being, one who understands H L A M slash T, one who seeks what Doug called very memorably a way of life in an integrated domain. Doug writes, we do not speak of isolated clever tricks that help in particular situations. We refer to a way of life in an integrated domain where hunches, cut and try, intangibles, and the human feel for a situation usefully coexist with powerful concepts, streamlined terminology and notation, sophisticated methods, and high-powered electronic aids. Those were the first words I read by Doug Engelbart when I stumbled across the 1962 report uh, late in my own career in 2004. I was immediately re reminded of some words by T.S. Eliot. This will seem a strange connection, but I hope it's in the spirit of Doug's integrated domain. Eliot wrote of the poet John Donne, a thought to Donne was an experience. It modified his sensibility. When a poet's mind is perfectly equipped for its work, it is constantly amalgamating disparate experience. The ordinary man's experience is chaotic, irregular, fragmentary. The latter falls in love or reads Spinoza, and these two experiences have nothing to do with each other or with the noise of the typewriter or the smell of cooking. In the mind of the poet, these experiences are always forming new holes. That integrated domain, that amalgamation of new holes is crucial. By contrast, we tend to want to think about the L or the A or the M or the T separately because it's easier, it's more efficient. Funders are always in love with isolated clever tricks that help in particular situations. But Doug understood that choosing a single point of intervention is a recipe for disaster. Our interventions must always have the system in view. Without the integrated domain, domain, we will certainly break things, most of all ourselves. Augmenting human intellect, a conceptual framework, remains the most powerful and comprehensive articulation of Doug's vision. Yet, while this is a profoundly personal work, uh, it is, I believe, a mistake to say that Doug worked largely in isolation. He wrote this from the depths of his being, but all along the way, he submitted his work to the scrutiny and often the baffled or even hostile critiques of others. And in fact, those critiques, as painful as they must have been to suffer through with their misunderstandings and condescension, they were helpful to Doug. Studying the process of his thinking from 1959 to 1963, I can see Doug worrying, revising, revising again, reaching out to various audiences, and never giving up. And I can see his more sympathetic colleagues reaching out to Doug despite their own bewilderment and doubts, trying to help. Here is a poignant example from March 1962. Doug's notes on a pamphlet his boss Jerry Noyes lent him, a pamphlet called How to Communicate Ideas. You can see what he learned from this little pamphlet in the bold, even poetic prose of the 1962 report, a report that becomes a declaration, even a manifesto. You've probably heard of J.C.R. Licklider. We just heard of Bob Taylor two of the heroes who eventually funded the work that led to the 1968 demo. But there are hidden figures in this story, too. As 1960 drew to its close, Doug found at last what all writers yearn for, his ideal readers, and even more to the point, colleagues of similar daring who had money to invest in his vision. When he got his grant, he came into contact with this woman, Rowena Swanson, the program officer, who coached, cajoled, teased, pushed, pushed and sometimes dragged Doug through the last stages of his monumental writing task. It was Rowena Swanson, a person of keen intelligence and deep insights and a zany sense of humor and a taste for eccentrics who knew what Doug could do and gave him the encouragement every writer craves and some never find. Doug turned in the draft of part one of his final report in early March 1962 and just a few days later Rowena Swanson had this response to Doug a response that Doug must have been hoping for for many, many years. She writes, Dear Doug, I read your report last night. 
Now I know what you meant when you said it had become something different from what you had originally intended. It may well be that what you have said has been said by others before you, and that I, through ignorance, am not aware of those other expositions. But I somehow doubt this, at least in part, and I marvel at the capabilities and the harnessing of them by one human being, which have resulted in what I read last night. There is nothing I have to ask you about what you wrote, because it all fits together so beautifully. Eventually, it would be a gem, nay, a gold mine of 133 pages, with an appendix of over 200 names and organizations, uh, with biographical information that my research assistant, Laura Kramer, has very kindly put together over the course of my work. This is an astonishing document that Rowena herself wrote about not long afterward in an article called Psychops and Computers about the country where the one-eyed man is king, a good description of Dyke Engelbart and his vision. The first printing of this report ran out, and when people saw Swanson's article, more requests came in. And when those requests came in, Doug said, we're on a second printing. We'll send it to you as soon as we can. And now I come to my conclusion. In one of his last public appearances, Doug Engelbart accepted the honor of becoming a fellow of the New Media Consortium. And I was there that day, and I watched and listened as Doug stood beside his daughter, Christina, and said these words of thanks. Well, this is, you know, a trite thing to say. I'm overwhelmed, but I sit here just feeling overwhelmed. You know, I wasn't doing all of those things in order to sit here and get something like this. It's been so many years. And I still have dreams about how the world could be. Anyway, I appreciate this very much, so thank you, thank you, Doug Engelbart said, and then he was seated. From the public debut of his dream in 1962 until the end of his life, Doug never stopped dreaming of how the world could be. And in his stirring and precise eulogy for Doug, Ted Nelson reminded us of what we must always celebrate about this man. Ted said, and I quote, no one ever had such a soaring view of human potential as Douglas Carl Engelbart. And he gave us wings to soar with him, though his mind flew on ahead where few could see, end quote. I believe that if you want to see Doug's wings, you will find them not at the mother of all demos, splendid as that flight is in that epical event. No, you will find Doug Engelbart's wings and the pair he left for you in that 1962 report, Augmenting Human Intellect, a Conceptual Framework. That report and how it came to be is the subject of my current research, supported by the Engelbart Institute. Early next year, I will help to lead a three-week online exploration of Doug's framework, an exploration I hope you will want to be part of. The centerpiece of this learning experience will be an opportunity for us to read and respond to Doug's magnificent 1962 framework. Together, we will annotate the document using a wonderful online annotation affordance called Hypothesis. You can read about the experience at framework.thoughtvectors.net. I hope you'll join us. Thank you. What a fabulous start to the day. Yes. And I just want to put three lines under the fact that Gardner's going to be leading a MOOC in, uh, isn't it in January, Christina? And you can get more info on that at the website for the uh, 50th anniversary, which is www.thedemo at 50.org.